Hi, everybody out there. Um, I'm here going to read the book of Hebrews. I'm reading the New International Version um, for those of you guys that are listening. And I wanted to just start doing something that's more of like book on audio, but I'm going to call it Bible on audio. You can find other people that read on YouTube. Um, but I thought it would be it would be a challenge for me and a way for me to connect with other people. So I'm going to continue um, to do so. Um, I'm going to open up in prayer and then I'll be reading Hebrews straight on. Um, hope you find this educational, um, life-giving word and that you come to a real relationship um, with uh, the one true living God. Um, okay, so I'm open up in prayer. Dear Father God, I'm so thankful to be here today for having these tools afforded to us like Facebook and internet and being able to connect with those that are not here with me. I will be reading Hebrews and I pray that you open up my mind, open up our minds and our hearts so that we can hear it and understand it and share it with others, Father God. Today, I want to lift up China. China, because they're going through a lockdown. There's uh, people that are dealing with food shortages and no other country is going through that just yet, but I pray that, that it doesn't move any further than where it is right now. That there be healing that there be restoration in Ukraine and other parts of the world that are also suffering with horrible weathers. And I just pray for healing for anybody suffering with an illness, not just COVID, but any illness, a cancer, um, AIDS, uh, any illness, Father God, and anything of their mind. I pray for sound minds for those that are suffering out there. And just thank you again. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hebrews. Although the author of Hebrews is unknown, this book was probably written in the late AD 60s. During this time, persecution was a real problem for the church in Rome. This letter was most likely written to the Jewish Christians in either Palestine or Rome, who were ready to give up their faith and return to Jewish beliefs of persecution. The book of Hebrews was written to teach Jewish Christians that Christ is from God and is better than angels, Moses, Josh, Joshua, or any priest. He is the ultimate high priest designated by God to, to be high priest in, in the order of Melchizedek. The author states that after Christ's death, the Old Testament sacrifices were no longer needed because Christ made the final sacrifice for all sins by dying himself. Um, that means like the older things that you had to do to gain your, your uh, salvation, which was uh, circumcision, um, sacrifices at an altar and burnt offerings they were no longer necessary once Jesus was in the picture from God and then that's what brought us to the Trinity. In chapter of 11 in Hebrews um, you'll find that it is famous chapter that summarizes the lives of men and women of faith in the Old Testament. These summaries are reminded the people of their heritage and gave the persecuted Christians great hope. The author encourages his readers to hold firmly to the faith we profess. Chapter 1 God's final word, his son. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided per purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs just saying he's the son of god and of course if in hierarchy he would be right there next to father god and holy spirit the son superior to angels for to which of the angels did god ever say you are my son today i have become your father or again i will be his father and he will be my son and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let's all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne of God will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Talking about him again about how, where, where he sits and, and who he's higher than and that angels worship him and that there are um, servants that uh, meet flames of fire. So that is, that, is, that is where we're at there. And now verse eight, but about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. 
a scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and have hated with wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? To none. There is only one. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? A warning to pay attention. Chapter 2. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Jesus made fully human. Verse 5. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And putting everything and putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at, as, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, shall should make the pioneer of their salvation, perfect through what he suffered. But the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brother and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your, your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. That's a blessing in itself. And, and Jesus just announcing and, and letting it be known that we are made lower than angels as well and that we we will be in heaven and that he suffered just as a man did until he ascended into heaven but he declares to us and calls us family brothers and sisters and he will put his trust in us and we can put our trust in him he says in verse 13 starting at 14 since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might be, become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted although just before he um, called us brothers and sisters and family like we're equal he pays the ultimate he becomes the sacrifice he knew he knew what it was like to be tempted he knows what suffering is and so He's not boasting that. And that that's something just that really hits my heart. He's just saying it, you know, matter of factly. Jesus greater than Moses. Chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Warning against unbelief. 
So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was hung, I was angry with the generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an, an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. He's, he's, <coughs> excuse me. He's talking about um, when the Israelites were in the desert and um, he was just saying, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, which means don't ignore it. Don't get so used to it that you just think, ah, oh, that's just Jesus. So could you imagine for 40 years, it's almost like there's a bickering back and forth. And that's why they suffered long suffering. And he declared after some anger that they'll never enter his rest because they're questioning God and taking for granted uh, what should have been a very short uh, path through the desert became 40 years. Verse 12, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to, to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end, as has just been said. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. That was really clear. Uh, just, just believe, hold on to your faith chapter 4 a sabbath rest rest for the people of god therefore since the promise of entering his rest still stands let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it for we have also have had i'm sorry for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed now we have now we who have believed enter the rest just as God has said so that that right there is saying to the unbeliever they're going to probably hear this or Jesus's word and think nothing of it and go on living but they will not enter rest um they will not enter peace with Jesus because they don't believe and that means that there's going to be believers like us that are reading that are praying that are in relationship that we hear a message and we hear the urgency in it but we'll look at somebody right next to us and say, do you not get it? And the truth is they won't get it because they don't have faith or they don't believe like you do. They've made a choice not to believe. Um, so there lies the difference. And there's where we can tell ourselves, don't get discouraged. Share a message if you can. Peace be with them if they'll take it. And if not, just understand some people will not receive it. All you can do is pray. <clears throat> now I'm starting on chapter 4 verse 3 now we who have believed enter the rest just as God has said so I declare on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest and yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words on the seventh day God rested from all his works and again in the passage above he says they shall never enter my rest Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I struggle with this because I'm still working out my salvation because we're never going to be perfect. But there are things we should let go. And that's that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, today if you hear my voice and you know it is what it is, drop all and follow me. But there, I don't want to argue. I, I argue with a lot of my peers over grace because I know I'm not perfect. And they look at me like, oh, you're a hypocrite. But I look at it like, no, I'm a sinner that needs saving. And so there's a fine line. You know, they, you just... Um, 
entitled to to interpreting the word and learning it and hearing the message as God will put on them. But that's what he's talking about. He's just saying, today you hear my voice. Do not harden your hearts. Do not ignore it. And once you ignore it, it is a hardening of hearts. You just don't hear the message anymore. Verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter the rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before, or laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And we know we will give account to Jesus. He will be through um, God. God gave permission to Jesus and says he's going to be the one that you approach on that day. And he's going to judge your heart. He's going to see where you're really at. And he will either say you are, your name is written in the book of life or depart from me. I do not know you. Um, Jesus, the great high priest, this is verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. He can empathize because he didn't sin, but he suffered the most suffering, the most painful of deaths. So he will understand. Chapter 5. Every high priest is, is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to us. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes dishonor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who called, who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. A warning against falling away. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you in the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. There's a progression when you're in the word. Um, there's a certain way you talk to children in Sunday school. And then there's, you know, the Sunday service and how the pastor will will challenge you or call you out uh, on things he sees the congregation or what is going on that shouldn't be. And um, he's saying that we are to act as the word tells us and be just as mature as the message that we understand is. I hope that that makes sense. Chapter 6, therefore let us move beyond the elementary teaching about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and of faith in God and instruction about cleansing rites, the laying of hands and resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of coming in age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. That's clear. Once you have just chosen to 
to, to turn away and act in your carnal ways like I don't know just just you just choose to go into that direction and you're not fighting it anymore you're not going against the grain you're telling people I don't want to know about what you're telling me I don't just okay like just leave it there and I'm going to continue they're saying there's no coming back from that and I'm just thankful that Jesus is the judge of that there I'm not going to give any any um truths there i'm just going to read it and tell you how i understand it and if you like in the comments share what you you have in mind so maybe i'll learn from you too something i miss verse seven land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of god but land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed in the end it will be burned even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Be good to one another, compassionate to the family body of Christ. <clears throat> that certainty of God's promise, verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms that it is said and puts an end to all argument because of God wanted to make the unchanging nature of the purpose very clear. So the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may greatly may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Chapter seven, Melchizedek the priest. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the, from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a 10th of everything. First, the name of Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without being, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains the priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of plunder. Excuse me. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who became priests to collect the tenth of the people. That is from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him, who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by whom, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Jesus like Melchizedek. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom those things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from the tribe has ever served at an altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. And what we have said is even more clear of another priest, like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of the indestructible life. For it is declared... You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So I'm going to stop right there and just say, um, in the Bible, it also says that we are to pay a tenth of our tithes to the church, to for um, the kingdom of God, for works. Um, and here it is just saying, 
that there is order in the in government order. We don't have a kingdom here in the United States, but we have a government, and it is right for us to pay our taxes. It is right for us to pay what is due. I mean, to the president, right? He's in charge of everything. So that is what he's saying. But there are two different kingdoms. There is a worldly order and there is a Christ order. And that is what he's saying here. Verse 18. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath but he who became a priest with an oath when God said to him the Lord has sw sworn and will not change his mind you are priest forever because of this oath Jesus has become the guarant the guarantor of a better covenant now there have been many in those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office but because Jesus lives forever he has a permanent priesthood Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifice day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law he appoints as high priest, men in all their weakness but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever so there he's saying how the priest shall conduct himself and that is why we can follow a man in order and that's why we have to pray for our government because we're to be following them but we hope that they are um holy blameless pure set apart from sinners exalted above the heavens and just meaning like you know there's a president and we all, I mean, we roll out the red carpet and all that and there's security and every, everything's shut down. It's like that for a reason and it is good in Jesus' sight. But we have to pray that our government is also living how Jesus is calling them to. That's all I'm going to say about that. Chapter 8. The High Priest of a New Covenant. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If we were on earth, we would not... If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the, the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the, mount, on the mountain. But in the fact, the ministry Jesus has received it is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises, for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turn away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. That's why we don't uh, have to enforce those like oh you gotta you gotta do this or or you gotta lay a sacrifice down or you gotta you know go up the mountain and, and lay a sacrifice of your son down to God to be forgiven of all your sins and no, we don't have to do that and the new covenant through Jesus has been has replaced that chapter 9 worship in the earthly tabernacle now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its first room where the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread 
This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered in the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. There were two, so a room in a room and Although few could enter in the first holy place, you had to be um, a high selected um, high priest to go into the inner room. And now Jesus makes it where we can come to him in prayer, that we can lay our needs and concerns at his feet, that we will be meeting him in heaven to be judged. There is, we do not have to worry that a high priest go in my place to um, plead my case uh, and that is a good thing the blood of Christ verse 11 but when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are now already here he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands that is to say is not a part of this creation he did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood thus obtaining eternal redemption the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who were cer ceremonially unclean, sanctifying them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. It's just saying he entered in the holy place that we have not even seen. It wasn't made by man. It's heaven. It's, heaven. it's, it's with God. It's with the Holy Ghost. It's, it's paid for by Jesus' blood. And so the rest is no longer needed. Verse 16. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even in the first covenant was not put out into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of Aesop, and sprinkled the scroll on all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God hath commanded you to keep. In the same way, he, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It is necessary then for the copies of heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, not now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place, every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So it's not a, a, a repetition of what, what happened. Like God's not going to send his son in human form to die on the cross for us again. It is done. 
That's why I'm reminded of this, of the, you know, I don't know if you saw in the movie or you read where it is finished through Jesus. <laughs> Until he comes again. Amen to that. So I'm just putting that out there. That it is said, <laughs> chapter 10, Christ's sacrifice once and for all. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be the same sacrifices repeatedly, endlessly, year after year. Make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the, wor for the worshipers would have cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an old reminder of sins. Are an annul I'm sorry are an annual reminder of sins it is impossible for blood and bulls and goats to take away sins therefore when christ came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased then i said here i am it is written about me in the scroll i have come to do your will my god for he said sacrifices and offerings burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire nor were you pleased with them Though they were offered in accordance with the law, then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since the time he waits for the enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Let me read that one more time. Verse 14. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds then he adds their sins and lawless acts i will remember no more and where these have been forgiven sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary a call to persevere in faith verse 19 therefore brothers and sisters since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of jesus by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body and since we have a great priest over the house of god let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider how we spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching that is now that uh, encourage one another keep hope keep faith remember that through our prayers that we meet god and he is forgiving our sins and that the price is already paid and all we have to do is believe and it is good to meet with one another it's good to meet on here and send prayers out or ask for somebody to help and and Find a way with God. And remember, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there, says Jesus. So he wants to answer. He paid the cost already. So there's a proof. Verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So in in the in the Old Testament, um, when you were found guilty, you died in front of three three others witnessed. And here it is saying that when we face judgment, we will die and and fall into the hands of the living God for punishment. 
once. <clears throat> so there will be judgment there. Because we have been rejected the law of God. Verse 31. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you have received the light when you endured it in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the con confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And by, by my righteous, one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Well, he says it there. Although there is grace and there is forgiveness, those that didn't ask for it, he will um, take no pleasure in what is to come to them. Verse 39. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. The family of Christ. Chapter 11. Faith in action. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Amen. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and not assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by, and by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commanded as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteous that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to the place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lives in tents, and as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he who looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. I am going to pause here. And I will return to chapter 11, verse 13. You will.